Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. I am Dr. Gopal Sharan Parashari. Uh, I am an assistant professor of economics in the Indian Institute of Technology, Dharwar, Karnataka in India. So I welcome you to this course uh, named Evolutionary Game Theory and Applications. So in the first lecture what we did, we went through some ideas about what game is, then, the, then we saw few examples how we formulate the game in different situations and then we discussed briefly about dominated strategies and dominant strategies. So in this lecture, what I will do, I will discuss some solution concepts and then we will touch upon a concept called repeated games. So let us proceed. We have a solution concept which is called dominance. The simple idea is uh, behind this uh, solution concept that a rational player will never play a strictly dominated strategy. Okay? <clears throat> because why? As we saw in the example of prisoner's dilemma that the dominated strategy was what? Cooperate was dominated strategy. So, cooperate was giving less payoff to this person, all was giving always the less payoff. Okay? So, this is the logic behind this that since this dominated strategy or to be more precise this strictly dominated strategy gives always less payoff. So, we can say a strategy that will always be inferior to another strategy. Just if you remember defect versus cooperate. Okay? So, cooperate was giving less payoff, less benefit. So, you see cooperate was 1 and 5, defect is 3 and 8. So, 3 is more than 1, 8 is more than 5. So, that is why defect is dominant strategy and cooperate is dominated strategy, strict, strictly dominated strategy. Okay? So, that is how the idea is that a rational player will never play a strictly dominated strategy. Okay? So, this is the basis of this solution concept. So, we can see in this prisoner's dilemma as I already told that cooperate is a strictly dominate, uh, dominated strategy. So, a person or player will never play this cooperate and will always play defect and same is true for both the players that means both player will play defect. Okay? So, we can say that defect comma defect is dominant strategy equilibrium. So, if we see which, which outcome is equilibrium of this game, this is defect comma defect. Why? Because the other op option cooperate, cooperate is strictly dominated and since this is strictly dominated or we can for, uh, the for the purpose of this lecture, we can I can call it dominated strategy. So, this, this gives lesser payoff compared to the dominant strategy. So, this rational player will never play cooperate. Okay? So, this is true for both the players. So, both player will play their dominant strategy which is defect. So, the outcome defect comma defect is dominant strategy equilibrium. I hope it is clear. So, if we move further and use the same logic then what we can do? There is something called iterated deletion of strictly dominated strategies. So, what we do? So, whatever strategy is strictly dominated, we keep on deleting them. Okay? Then we get some, uh, we are left with some outcome and that becomes our equilibrium. Okay? We will take this example of R&D competition game that we discussed as an example. Okay? So, if we see here, so suppose in the same manner, firm B decides to invest. We are here. So, then if firm A invest, it gets 2 not invest gets 1. So, 2 is more than 1. I am encircling the better thing. Okay? Similarly, suppose firm B is here, then firm A is getting 4 by investing and 3 by not investing. So, clearly 4 is more than 3. So, 4 is, we can write like this, 4 is better. Okay? Same is true for firm B. So, what happens? Invest is dominant strategy and not invest in 
not invest is dominated strat strategy. So, what we can do? We can delete these. So, I can delete it for player 1 say. So, player 1 will never never play not invest. Similarly, this is true for firm B also. So, we can delete this also. So, we are left with this. So, invest comma invest is the remaining outcome by the process of this iterated deletion of strictly dominated strategies. And the logic behind is a rational player will never play this strictly dominated strategies. Okay. Similarly, we can have this example. Okay. If we pay attention in this game, then we see that there is no strictly dominant strategy for player 1. Then we see that there is no strictly dominated strategy for player 1. These are the two observation that you can make looking at this game. But if you see, there is a strictly dominated strategy for player 2. Okay. So, for player 2, if we see that strategy C is strictly dominated by R. Okay. So, this is C, this is R. So, by C, this person is getting 1, 4, 6. By choosing R, player 2 is getting 2, 6 and 8. And you can see 2 is more than 1, 6 is more than 4, 8 is more than 6. Okay. So, this is how as all 3 are more than the other corresponding 3. So, this is how this strategy R is or we can write C is strictly dominated by R and as the process goes iterated deletion or elimination of strictly dominated strategies. So, we can eliminate C. Okay. Because you can see here this common knowledge is coming into play because player 1 also knows that player 2 will never play strategy C because it is strictly dominated. Okay. So, that is also coming into picture that is why we can go for this iterated elimination of strictly dominated strategies. So, we will go like this. So, player 2 will never play this strategy C as it is strictly dominated. So, we may delete it. I have already crossed this line. Okay. So, this is deleted. So, clearly this player 2 will never play C. So, I have already cut it. I am again doing this. So, we can eliminate this. Okay. The remaining game is this, this matrix. So, if you see this, then you can clearly see that M and D are both strictly dominated by U for player 1. So, clearly with our logic player 1, one will never play M and D as they are uh, strictly dominated by U. How they are dominated you can see. So, by M this person is getting 2 if player 2 plays L and 3 if player 2 plays R. Okay. With U it is getting 4 comma 6. So, clearly we can see 4 is more than 2, 6 is more than 3. Here also we can see 4 is more than 2, 6 is more than 3 here. Okay. Similarly, here also 4 is more than this 3, 6 is more than 2. So, clearly M and D are strictly dominated actions of player 1. Okay. Oh, and who dominates? U dominates. So, what we can do? We can delete this M and T as I have already done in this picture and we are remaining remaining strategies U only. So, this is what we get after deleting M and D. And now, this, this residual game we see that R is again dominated strictly dominated for by L before player 2. Okay. So, by playing R player 2 is getting 2 and by playing L player 2 is getting 3. So, 3 is more than 2. So, that is why we can say R is strictly dominated by L for player 2. So, we can again cut this eliminate this. So, there is no R then. So, what is remaining? We have got only this cell in the last. So, we can say this U comma L is our equilibrium by this method of iterated elimination or deletion of strictly dominated strategies and corresponding to this outcome equilibrium outcome we have 
payoffs like this 4 comma 3 okay so this is how we apply this method of iterated elimination of strictly dominated state disease okay having done this dominance and the iterated deletion of dominated strategies what we will do we will see the equilibrium concept called nash equilibrium which is very popular one i think most of us have heard about it so basically <coughs> if i define nash equilibrium then a nash equilibrium is an action profile we can call it a star with a property that no player can do better by switching to something else other than AI star given that every other player sticks to his original choice. So, this is the idea of Nash equilibrium or simply we can say that given that all other players play their Nash equilibrium strategy or action, any player cannot gain by changing his or her actions okay? and this should be true for all players. So, simply Nash equilibrium is a condition when any player cannot change his, his or her payoff or cannot do better by unilaterally changing to something else other than his Nash equilibrium choice and this should be true for all players. So, basically we can say what everyone is doing, everyone is playing optimally against what everyone else is doing. Okay? So, this is how we define Nash equilibrium. Again I am repeating. Suppose, as we discussed many games, for example, we discussed prisoner's dilemma when there were two choices defect and cooperate. Similarly, in other games also. So, the idea is whatever players are choosing in equilibrium, then they cannot gain by changing to something else, some other action, given that other all other players are playing the same strategy that is they are playing in equilibrium. So, this is the idea of Nash equilibrium. So, basically <coughs> as I told you that what players are doing they are optimally playing the against the optimal action of other players. Okay? So, on the similar lines we can define something called best response function. So, basically in equilibrium every player is happy to play his strategy and has no desire to change. Okay, in response to the other players strategic choices. So, as I already told that there is no benefit of changing his or her action to something else. This is the uh, definition of Nash equilibrium. So, basically we can call that this is statistically sta stable solution. Okay. On the same lines we can define this next Nash equilibrium as that action profile for which every players action is a best response to other players actions. Okay. So, best response is the response which gives highest payoff to that player. So, suppose one player is playing and given the action of the other player, whatever action of this player gives him or her the highest payoff is called best response of that player against the action of the other player. Okay? So, suppose we can define like this that the A 1 star is suppose the we will uh, write like this b1 this, so v1 is best response of player 1 for a2 star action profile of player 2 or action of player 2 okay similarly we can define a2 star which is the equilibrium action of uh, player 2 so this is nothing but best response of player 2 for action of equilibrium action of player 1. So, this is how we define best response okay? and this function b i capital B i this is called best response function. It, this is a set valued function it means that it associates a set of actions with any list of other players actions. So, this is how we define it. Okay? So, having defined this Nash equilibrium and best response function what we can do? we will take up some examples and try to find out Nash equilibrium with the help of best responses, okay? best response function. So, basically we will again go back to our uh, classical example of prisoner's dilemma that we have been discussing since last class also. So, basically here we know that they are player 1, player 2 <coughs> and both of them has choice of two actions or strategies that is either they can defect and or they cooperate. Okay? Similarly, player 2 can defect or cooperate. Okay. The game matrix you understand, the payoffs, everything, the story behind it. What we will do? 
we will just see how we find out best responses here. Okay. So, basically here this best response of player 1 B R 1 that means best response of player 1 of defect that means what is the best response of player 1 if other person other player that is player 2 is playing defect. Okay. So, basically so we are looking at what is the best response of player 1 corresponding to defect of player 2. Okay. So, we can see suppose we are assuming that player 2 is playing defect so that we are in this column then we have to see best response of defect of player 1. So, best response of player 1 for defect that means when player 2 plays defect. Okay. So, that should be so we can see here if player 1 responds with defect then it gets 3 okay. and if it re responds with cooperate it gets 1 he gets 1. Okay. So, clearly 3 is more than 1. Okay. So, that is why he is getting better payoff in defect. Okay. So, this is how we can tell this that best response of defect for player 1 is defect. So, this is defect. Okay. So, best, best response is nothing but the action available to that player which gives highest payoff to that player against some action of other player. Okay. So, this is how we found out that best response of defect for player 1 is defect. Similarly, best response of player 1 co for cooperate that means player 2 is cooperating we are here is again defect. How? Because here by playing defect he is getting 8 and here by playing cooperate he is getting 5. So, clearly 8 is more than 5. Okay. So, this is how we see that best response of player 1 against cooperate is also defect. Okay. So, this is how we saw best responses of player 1. Now, similarly we will see the best responses of player 2. So, again we will see best response B R 2 that is best response of player 2 against defect that means player 1 is defecting then what is the best response of player 2 that is what is the response or what should be the choice of player 1 the, uh, player 2 that gives highest payoff to player 2 against defect of player 1. So, basically player 1 is defecting that means we are here then if player 2 plays defect it gets 3 if it cooperates it gets 1. So, clearly 3 is more than 1. So, defect is best response. So, we can say best response of player 2 against defect of player 1 is defect. Okay. Similarly, we can find out B R 2 of cooperate that means best response of player 2 when player 1 cooperates. So, we are here. So, by player 2 by defecting gets 8, player 2 by cooperating gets 5. So, clearly 8 is more than 5. So, best response of cooperate for player 2 is again defect. Okay. So, we can write best response of player 2 for cooperate is defect. Okay. Then there is something called best response correspondence. Okay. So, as I told you in previous slide that what is happening here A 1 star is the equilibrium action of player 1 that is best response of player 1 against equilibrium action of player 2. Similarly, A 2 star which is equilibrium action of player 2 this is best response of player 2 against equilibrium action of player 1 that is A 1 star. So, basically both players are playing best responses to each other okay so the in the equilibrium in the nash equilibrium so this is called best response correspondence that means every player playing a best response against each other so here simply we can say with the same thing that where best responses are meeting that uh, then that uh, that outcome is called nash equilibrium so basically here we can see where it is meeting defect defect okay so defect defect is the Nash equilibrium. Okay. So, I can just draw this game matrix and without doing that much of hard work we can simply get it like this. So, suppose this is 
defect for player 1, cooperate for player 1, this is defect for player 2, cooperate for player 2, here they are getting 3 comma 3, here it is 8 comma 1. So, this is 1 comma 8, this is 5 comma 5, okay, this is player 1, this is player 2. So, we can simply do like this. So, suppose we consider that player 2 is playing D, we are here in this column, first column. Okay, then player 1 will play, will get 3 from defect and 1 from cooperate, 3 from defect and 1 from cooperate. So, which is better? 3 is the best response as we already saw, defect is the best response. Okay. Similarly, suppose we are here, player 2 is playing C, then by playing defect, player 1 is getting 8, by playing cooperate, player uh, 1 is getting 5. So, 8 is more than 5. So, what we can do? This D is best response here. Okay. Similarly, for player 2, suppose player 1 plays D, so we are in the first row. So, by playing defect, player 2 is getting 3, by playing cooperate, player uh, 2 is getting 1. So, 3 is more than 1, so defect is best response. Okay. Now, suppose player 2 is playing C, then player 2 is getting 8 by playing D and 5 by playing C. So, clearly 8 is more than 5, so 8 is best response. Okay. So, we can see here, this is the cell where best responses of both the players are meeting or converging. So, that is why this is Nash equilibrium. So, this is called best response correspondence, best response correspondence. Okay. As I already told you, where the best responses of both players meet or converge. What does that mean? That each player is playing best response against each other. Okay. So, this is how we define it. So, having find this Nash equilibrium in this game of prisoner's dilemma, what we can do, we will take up another example, which is we have already done this, this is battle of sexes. Okay. So, you again know the story already, because we have already discussed that there are there is a couple, there is a husband and wife, they are they want to go for an outing and they have two choices, either they can go for a football match or to watch a movie and based on this story, uh, we came up with the uh, game matrix in the previous lecture. So, we will take up that same game matrix. Okay and we will try to find out best responses and then Nash equilibrium by best response correspondence. Okay. So, basically if we see here, so we want to see best response of husband B R H of football. That means, what is the optimal action of husband when wife is going for football. Okay. So, we can see here, so when wife is going for football, we are in this column. Then if husband chooses football, gets 2 and it when it chooses movie, it gets 0. So, best response is football for husband as 2 is more than 0. Okay. Similarly, what is the best response of husband when wife chooses movie? So, that means we are in here. So, if husband chooses football, he gets 0, husband chooses movie, he gets 1. Okay. So, clearly 1 is more than 0. So, best response of movie is best, uh, best response for movie is movie for husband. Okay. So, similarly we can find out best responses of wife. So, basically B R W football. So, idea is best response of wife when husband chooses football. So, clearly husband chooses football that means we are in this row and then when wife chooses football she gets 1, when wife chooses movie she gets 0. Clearly 1 is more than 0. So, basically football is the best response for football for wife when husband plays football. Similarly, best response of wife when husband chooses movie. So, so then we are here in the second row. So, if wife chooses football, she gets 0, wife chooses movie, she gets 2. Clearly, 2 is more than 0. So, best response of movie is movie for wife. Okay. So, basically we can see the best response correspondence. So, when wife is choosing football, the best response for husband is also football. Similarly, when husband is choosing football, wife is also choosing football as a best response. So, basically clearly football, football clearly is an outcome where best responses converge. So, this is, is 
one Nash equilibrium. We can also see that when wife chooses movie, husband is also choosing movie and when husband is choosing movie, wife is also choosing movie. So, movie movie is also shows the best response correspondence. Okay. So, movie movie is also a best response. So, this way we have two Nash equilibria in this game football football and movie movie. Okay. We will take up one more example which is matching pennies. This game also we discussed as an example in the previous lecture. So, we will again take up the same example and try to find out Nash equilibrium here with the help of best response correspondence. Fine. So, there are two players P 1 and P 2 depending upon uh, when they toss a coin depending upon they get head or tail they get these payoff like on the basis of this game matrix that we came up with the help of the story that we did in the previous class. So, basically we if, if we just go by game table and try to find out the best responses. So, basically best response of player 1 of head that means when player 2 chooses head or gets head then what is the best response of player 1. So, when player 2 chooses head that means we are in the first column here and then a head for player 1 will give 1 and a tail for player 1 will give minus 1. So, clearly 1 is more than minus 1. So, best response of head is head. Okay. Similarly, best response of tail <coughs> when player 2 plays tail. So, this is basically best response of player 1 for tail. So, that means we are here in this column player 2 is playing tail. So, if player 1 plays head it gets minus 1 and if it plays tail it gets 1. So, clearly tail is the best response as 1 is greater than minus 1. So, best response of tail for player 1 is tail. Okay. Similarly, for player 2. So, best response of player 2 for head that means other player is playing head. So, we are in this row. Okay. So, basically what is happening? <coughs> so, suppose player 2 is playing head then it is getting minus 1. If he is playing tail he is getting 1. So, clearly 1 is more than minus 1. So, tail is the best response. So, see here best response of player 2 for head of player 1 is tail and similarly the best response of player 2 for tail that means we are here is head. Why? because by player 2 by playing head is getting 1 by playing tail is getting minus 1. So, clearly 1 is more than minus 1. So, head is the best response. Now, see here the best response correspondence. Okay. So, if we see the best response correspondence then we see that for head player 1 s best response is head for head player 2 s best response is tail. Similarly, for tail player 1 s best response is tail, but for player 2 the best response of tail is head. So, we see clearly there is no <coughs> best response correspondence, no best response correspondence. Okay. That means simply means best responses do not converge. Okay. This clearly says that there is no Nash equilibrium. Okay. So, there are games certain games where there are no Nash equilibrium to be more precise in pure strategies. What we are dealing right now is pure strategies. Okay. So, when I am saying there is no Nash, Nash equilibrium that is when we are talking about the pure strategies. strategies. There is something called mixed strategies. If we do that then we will surely get one Nash equilibrium one or more than one Nash equilibria in this game also. Okay. So, we will do mixed strategy when we will do evolutionary, evolutionary stable strategies then we will do mixed ESS also in the coming lectures. Okay. Fine. So, having done that I will quickly tell what a symmetric game is. So, basically <coughs> a two player game is symmetric if each player has the same set of actions and each player's evaluation of an outcome depends only on her action and that of her opponent, okay? not on whether she is player 1 or player 2. 
Okay. So, simply <coughs> what is happening? We have done a few examples. For example, we did prisoner's, prisoner's dilemma. That is precisely is a symmetric game. So, it was player 1, it can defect or cooperate. Similarly, player 2 can defect or cooperate. This is player 2. Okay. So, what they were getting? We can complete the game table from the previous thing 3381. So, this is 3 comma 3, 8 comma 1, 1 comma 8 and 5 comma 5. This was our game table. So, what it says when there is a two player game is symmetric, when each player has same set of action. So, clearly each player have here both players have same set of actions D and C, either they can defect or cooperate. And also the <coughs> Players evaluation of an outcome is depend is depending upon only upon his action and the action of the opponents. It does not matter whether whether it is player 1 or player 2. For example, you can see here when the outcome is defect comma defect. Okay. So, it is getting 3 comma 3. It does not matter whether player 1 is there or player 2, it is same for both of them. Similarly, when one player cooperates. I am writing just C and other player defects. Okay. So, then the cooperator is getting 1 and defector is getting 8. Okay. Now, suppose we change it, then here also the cooperator is getting 1, defector is getting 8. So, it does not matter who is playing. Okay. The evaluation is based upon only on C and D. Okay. If player 1 is cooperating, then he is getting 1 and player 2 is defecting, then he is getting 8. If we go for just opposite, if player 1 start defecting, then he is getting some just same payoff 8 and now player 2 cooperates, so he is getting 1. So, these things got reversed. So, this kind of situation is called symmetric games that are very important uh, when we talk about this evolutionary game theory. So, we will be dealing with these kind of games uh, uh, there in the evolutionary game theory that we will start in from the next lecture. Okay. So, okay. basically, so idea is player 1 feels the same way, this is what I was telling that the outcome a 1 comma a 2, here we can consider say c and d, c d in which her action is a 1 and her opponent's action is a 2, as player 2 feels about the outcome a 2 comma a 1 in which her action is a 1 and her opponent's action is a 2. So, basically, that is what I was telling that suppose player 1 is thinking same about c comma d same thing player 2 is thinking about d comma c. So, this is what I was telling. So, this kind of game is called symmetric games okay. and whenever in symmetric games we get this kind of equilibrium. So, defect comma defect is Nash equilibrium we already know in this game. So, this kind of game when same action is there, this kind of equilibrium is called symmetric Nash equilibrium. I am telling very briefly because we will cover in uh, evolutionary game theory after this lecture symmetric Nash equilibrium. Okay. Symmetric Nash equilibrium. So, having done this, now what we will do? We will touch upon a concept called repeated games. So, basically, what happens till now what we discuss uh, the kind of games we discuss there what is happening players are meeting just once and playing the game only once and then they do not know each other. Okay. But what happens in many situations in real life what we will see and we also realize that <coughs> there are repeated interactions. What does it mean? The, it means that players meet more than once. It is not like that they will just interact once and then play this game and what is happening later it does not matter. But here what happens in many uh, real life situations, they interact repeatedly. Okay. There are repeated occurrences of this interaction. Okay. For example, if we think about any two firms, any two FMCG companies, they keep on interacting in every year if we talk about year as a period or say quarter in the business world, then we can think that they keep on interacting in each quarter. Similarly, two airlines, they keep on competing in each quarter for market share, for say output level or say prices. 
So, these kind of competition, uh, these kind of uh, interactions are repeated interactions. So, this is not happening that say some FMCG giants for example, Procter and Gamble and Hindustan Lever, they are just interacting once. No, what is happening in each quarter or each year or whatever period you consider, they keep on interacting repeatedly. Similarly, any two year lines or you can get many such examples. Okay. So, what is the difference between these two situations? So, when they are just interacting once, then they need not to care much about long term or anything else apart from the that game itself in that period. But in such situations that I am talking about in repeated games, what they are doing, they are uh, interacting repeatedly. So, then they also need to think about the future. So, what this is what I mean here that firms need to look at short term as well as long term. Okay. Thus, they behave differently compared to their behavior in a one shot game. The kind of game we did till now, they are called one shot game because players are playing just once, but here players are playing repeatedly. So, the players need to think about short term as well as, well as long term. Okay. So, basically we can take one example, say uh, two companies are competing for price and suppose one firm lowers its price today okay, to get more business. Okay. Clearly, if there are suppose two firms and one firm, one firm lowers the price, then all the business almost all the business will get shifted to this firm. Okay. But what happens? So, uh, the interaction is not ending there, then the next year will come or the next quarter will come, then what will happen? The other rival firm that may also retaliate in the future okay. and that may reduce the price even at the lower level. What will happen then? The benefits this first firm got by reducing the price that will got nullified. Okay. So, all the uh, business will be shifted to the second firm. Okay. So, the idea is that while cutting the price in the first period itself, the first firm has to think about these things. That is why I am telling that they need to think about long term or about the future. Okay. So, this is the difference between repeated games and one shot games. Okay. So, basically we can take one example, uh, this price competition or price war. So, where there are two firms, firm 1 and firm 2. Okay. So, both firms has two uh, options, two actions available, one is high and other one is low. What do we mean by high and low? High means keeping price high, low means keeping price low. Similarly, firm 2 can also keep high price or low price. Okay. And depending upon this thing, we have got a, uh, we have got these numbers, the payoffs in each cell of the game. So, now you think about playing this game once as a one shot game. as we have been doing till now and also think what will happen if this game is played repeatedly many times. Okay. So, one time we can just think about it. So, suppose we will just solve it by the best response correspondence. So, for example, just assume that firm 2 is keeping high price. So, we are here. So, then now if firm 1 chooses high price, it gets 2. If it chooses low price, it gets 3. So, clearly 3 is more. So, 3 is the best response of firm 2's high price by firm 1. Okay. How about if firm 2 chooses low price? So, if firm 2 chooses low price, then firm 1 gets 0 by choosing high price and 1 by choosing low price. So, this is best response of firm 1 when firm 2 chooses low. Okay. Similarly, now suppose firm 1 chooses high price. So, we are in this row. Now, firm 2 by choosing high gets 2 and by choosing low gets 3. So, clearly 3 is more than 2. So, this is low is the best response. Now, suppose firm 1 chooses low price. So, we are in this row. So, by choosing high firm 2 gets 0 and by choosing low firm 2 gets 1. So, again 1 is more than 0. So, 1 that means low is the best response. So, by best response correspondence we see here both best responses are converging. So, low comma low is Nash equilibrium by best response correspondence. Okay. So, this is happening when both are playing a one shot game. Okay. How about if they play this game repeatedly? 
will this remain same or something will change ok. So, think of to think about it what we can consider. So, basically <coughs> players play this game repeatedly over time. So, here we saw this game was being played once then if it is being being played repeatedly then we call this game as stays game. So, this is being played once. So, each period this is being played. So, this is why it is called stays game and this is being played repeatedly when we talk about repeated games. Okay. Then we can divide these uh, repeated games into two types. This is finitely repeated game. This is when one knows when the game is ending. Okay. An infinitely repeated game is when one does not know when the game is ending. So, this is the idea of infinitely repeated games. Okay. So, when we think about infinitely repeated game, we can think about the either the firms or the players have infinite lives or basically as I already told that they do not know when the game will end. Okay. So, as I was telling that uh, you think about this game that we saw just now the price competition or price war. So, low comma low is a Nash equilibrium when they play this game just for once. Okay. Think about it again and think in repeated games kind of setting. So, this may also happen that both firms can come up with an agreement to collude. Okay. It is it often happens we have uh, come across these kind of you know news. Okay. So, what happens if they collude what do we mean by collude? They both decide okay, that we will both keep high prices or some price they get collude. There is a tacit agreement between them that we will keep this price okay, to for uh, clearly for their benefit. Okay. Both of them will benefit either they whatever they decide either to put high price or low price. Okay. So, the idea is they decide to collude. Okay. Then the idea is what is stopping any one of them to breach that agreement of collusion. Okay. They may breach any time. So, suppose they have decided to put some price to keep some price, but then any one of them may think that if I breach this agreement then I can get more benefit. Okay. So, this threat is always there. So, the idea is what is keeping these players from not breaching this agreement. So, the idea is to how to sustain this collusion. Okay. To sustain this collusion there should be some punishment mechanism or strategy. Okay. So, repeated games have such mechanisms okay, that we will discuss. So, again I am telling. So, what I saw here that this is the game that companies are playing or firms are playing. So, if this is a one shot game then the Nash equilibrium is low comma low. Okay. But, suppose as I told you this is a not uh, kind of one period interaction, this is a prolonged interaction and it keeps on happening repeatedly. Okay. So, what these companies may do they can come up with an agreement that we will keep this price whatever this decide as per their uh, you know benefit or profit calculations. Okay. And then what may happen that in any subsequent period any firm any of these two firms may have an incentive to breach this agreement. Okay. So, the idea is how to keep this agreement intact. Okay. So, this is the idea. So, for that there are certain punishment mechanisms okay, that are in place and they act to keep this agreement working. Okay. I hope it is clear what I am talking about. So, basically when we talk about repeated games, so there are two such strategies. Okay. One is called tit for tat strategy. So, these are the punishment strategies I am telling punishment strategies.
Okay. So, clearly I can uh, explain it more a bit. So, for example, if we consider the prisoner's dilemma game as we were doing here. So, basically in prisoner's dilemma what is happening? So, either player 1 can cooperate or defect. Okay. These two actions are available to both the players. Now, the idea is suppose I am just talking about some uh, imaginary situation that in suppose this game is being played repeatedly with between with these uh, between these players. So, what will happen? Suppose they decide to play cooperate. So, they are these two prisoners of players cooperating in each period like this. They decide that we will do this, but my idea is like who is stopping any one of them to breach this agreement. Okay. The same kind of situation I have been talking about in case of two firms that are uh, that are into an agreement to keep some fixed price as per their benefit. Okay. Same thing we can think about in this prisoner's dilemma. So, suppose if two prisoners decide that we will cooperate with each other, if we go by story line, then we can say that two players decide or two prisoners decide that they will not become an informer against each other, both of them decide. But we know that from here, if they move to this cell or this cell, that means if one person unilaterally deviates, that means chooses D instead of C, then it may get benefit. Okay. So, there is an incentive to deviate. So, idea is what is stopping this person from deviating from C. Okay. So, every agreement was to play C, 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 C for both the players, but clearly as per the game matrix, any one of them can switch to D to get more benefit, more payoff. Okay. So, the idea is how to stop this in repeated game setting. So, this is the same thing I am telling here in the case of this game, the price competition game between two firms. Okay. So, for example, we can consider simply that both firms decide that they will keep high price, high price. So, in each period they are playing H, 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 H and so on. But if you see when they are playing high price, high price, they are getting 2 comma 2. But suppose one firm starts putting low price, say firm 1, then firm 1 will get 3 instead of 2 okay, and firm 2 will get 0. So, this is the idea. So, clearly firm 1, if, we, if it switches to L from H, then it gets benefit from 2 to 3. So, this agreement of keeping say high price is always not there. Okay. So, there is an incentive for a firm to breach it. So, these strategies or punishment strategies I am talking about, these are for such situations only. So, the idea is in this strategy called tit for tat, what this uh, firm will do, the strategy is that you start with high, the firm will start with high. Okay. Then, what it will do in subsequent periods? Play what your opponent has played in last period. So, this is the idea. Okay. So, basically, if I want to describe it, how will I do it? So, tit for tat is this is from 1, this is from 2. Okay. So, we are looking at uh, the perspective of the firm 1. So, suppose both firms start from high. Okay. So, this is how it will start from high. Then in subsequent period, play what your opponent has played in the last period. So, again say now it comes uh, suppose player 1 plays, so it will play H as player 2 has played H in the last period. Now, again in the next period suppose this again plays H, then player 1 will again play H as player H 2 has played H in the last period. Now, say in this trail, player 2 changes to low at some point of time. So, as player 2 changes to low, then what this uh, player 1 will do in the next period? He will play low as the strategy is to play what your opponent has plays, played in last period. Okay. So, again suppose it plays 
low, then this will again play low. Now, suppose it again switches to H, player 1 will again switch to H. So, this is the idea. So, this strategy is called tit for tat strategy. Okay. So, start with H, then play what your opponent has played in the previous period. You can see here. Okay. So, they started with H, as long as the opponent was playing H, this was he was playing H, but if the opponent moves to switches to L, then this player also plays L. Okay. If it again switches to H, then this player also switches to H. So, as the name suggests, this is called tit for tat strategy. Okay. This is one of the punishment strategies that are used while modeling these repeated games. Okay. There is one more strategy, similar strategy, it is called grim trigger strategy. Okay. So, this is <coughs> more stringent compared to the tit for tat strategy. So, again we will take the same example. Okay. So, here what it tells? It tells that start with high okay, and then continue with high as long as everybody always played high. Okay. And if anybody ever played low in the past, play low forever. Okay. So, I can tell you. So, suppose this is firm 1. this is from 2. Okay. So, from 1 will start with high, this is also playing high. So, there is a, so uh, we can again go back to our story I was telling that they are into a, an agreement that they will play high. Okay. So, they start playing high, they are playing high, 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 high. So, this goes on, but at some point of time suppose from 2 breaches the agreement and it plays low. Then, according to this Grim Tiger strategy, what will happen? This firm 1 will start playing low forever for the rest of the game, okay. no matter what firm 2 does here now. Okay. So, once the opponent breaches the agreement, it starts playing low in place of high in this example, then firm 1 will switch to L for entire rest of the game. Okay. So, this is how we define these strategies in uh, repeated games. So, we discuss this Grim Tiger strategy and tit for tat strategy in the previous slides. So, when we will do this uh, evolution of cooperation in coming lectures on the basis of uh, evolutionary game theory we will do, then we will use uh, one of these strategies okay, in those models. Okay. So, I think this is where I will stop. So, basically we discussed in this uh, two lectures, two uh, lectures in uh, previous lectures that what is a game then we decided uh, then we discussed some uh, solution concepts okay and then we saw what are the dominated strategies and dominant strategies on the basis of that we discussed few solution concept now having done this we will proceed with our journey of evolutionary game theory from the next class so thank you very much Hello, I am A. K. Sharma and I teach sociology in IIT Kanpur. Uh, I am trying to answer a simple question, how sociologists explain their facts. As you know that uh, sociology was developed as a subject dealing with human behavior, but which would use the tools and techniques of science, mathematics, physics, chemist, chemistry. But this view that uh, human behavior needs to be studied scientifically has been contradicted later on and it was said 
that simply by relating one kind of facts with other kinds of facts, you cannot understand human behavior to, to understand human behavior or to actually theorize about human behavior. You have to theorize the theories or motivations or meanings that people have in their mind uh, in involving in a particular action. Now, uh, using these two traditions, one tradition in which we relate one fact of society with other facts scientifically and another tradition in which we try to develop second order constructs or theories of theories that people have in their mind in acting in day to day life. Now, they have produced two different traditions in sociology. One is called quantitative, another is called qualitative. Quantitative methodology uses scientific methods of conducting surveys, censuses, experiments uh, and uh, then by using statistical methods from simple method like uh, arithmetic mean uh, to sophisticated methods like logistic regression, we try to arrive at uh, some inference. Qualitative tradition, qualitative methodology on the other hand uses ethnographic approach and here the researcher uh, attempts to become part of the community which he or she intends to study. Because the assumption is that only by becoming part of the community, by living among the people whom you are studying and by putting yourself in their shoes, by trying to understand things or their environment or their behavior or their culture or festivals or economic behavior or politics from their angle, from their perspective, how they feel, what, what understanding they carry in their mind, that only by understanding these things we can understand facts of society. Actually in one of the latest works, uh, World Bank, you know, which uses a lot of statistics, has also talked about uh, understanding mental models that people use in involving in behavior. Emile Durkheim long back said that sociology uses comparative method and let me just give one example and uh, then I will finish. Suppose I tell you that infant mortality rate in India is 40. What does it mean? It means nothing. But when you compare infant mortality of India today with Japan and you find that Japan has 2 and India has 40 then you get disturbed, then you start thinking why is it that infant mortality in India is so high. And then you can also compare infant mortality of India with infant mortality of say Kenya or Mozambique or other countries and you find that uh, these countries have much higher infant mortality than India. And then you can uh, create a hypothesis that perhaps uh, econo economic development has something to do with infant mortality. Countries which are more developed, countries like Japan, they have low infant mortality. Countries like Mozambique or Kenya, which are less developed, have higher infant mortality. So, you have a connection. This is what sociology is about, connection between facts. So, by using census, surveys, by conducting field work, by using ethnographic methods, by using comparative methods, we arrive at sociological findings. Use of experimental method in sociology has been very less, uh, but I learned that recently economists, which I 10 years ago I could not uh, uh, see that economists will one day use experimental method, but today we find that economists are using lot of experimental methods to study human behavior. Now, this work may be done by economists, but the findings of their study can very well be called sociological studies. So, sociology tomorrow, uh, 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 I think that sociology tomorrow in addition to and comparative methods will also be using experimental